Pod Tackler, episode 363, Save One Bullet, for April 25th, 2013. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pod Tackler, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast. I'm your host, Dust Storm. And I'm your other host, Brent Gamer. And today we are going to be talking about some more Halo update and some other things that have come out over the last week or so. We have the reveal of the reveal of the next Xbox that got announced this week. Um, there's a couple other things going on in the Halo community that we're going to touch on as well. But first things first, Brent, how has your Halo experience been over the last couple of weeks with the Castle Map Pack and everything? Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I've uh, had a pretty good experience with the Castle Maps. Um, I haven't played as much as I thought I would. Uh, I started playing a browser-based Godfather game. It's kind of awful, but at the same time, like I can't quit playing. It's like one of those yeah. things that you don't want to start doing because it's bad. Right. I mean, it's, it's not a good game. I'm not saying it's bad, like immoral. It's just not a good game. It's not fun, but at the same time, you just, I guess, the incremental increase in your power, like they, that, kind of hooks you. So you got to keep coming back time and time again. Uh, right, it's, it's, and, and and for us it's Halo. We we like Halo. Yeah. Uh, so been doing that. Um, other Is than it, that, it's uh, it's been kind of a a slow week for Halo. Yeah, it it seems it. like it, it's kind of gotten to a lull. I don't know if it's just with Halo or if it's um since it's kind of the mat, last map pack has come out and we're not really seeing uh many more. I mean, there's lots of updates coming around the corner, but as far as the general consumers concerned, all the stuff that's out there for Halo has been put out there. Yeah. I mean, the CSR really doesn't matter to the average consumer in terms of of having the game and just ha- having it for fun. That's more of the core audience of Halo that really matters about CSR. And I don't know, for Monday Night Matchmaking this week, we had an incredibly low turnout from what we've had in the past. Wacky Wednesday is still uh, going strong. It's our customs night, and... We had, I think, probably a total of maybe 22, 24 different people come through on Wednesday or yesterday, but matchmaking this week was really, really low. Yeah. It was kind of strange. Uh, uh, population on matchmaking just... It seems like it keeps dropping off and then it'll rise up a little bit, but it's mostly just been a downward trend. Um, it's kind of alarming. That's been one of the things that uh, Halo Gaff talks about quite frequently. Um, if you go to Halo Charts, I think that's the website. Um, you can actually see a detailed list of the populations and each playlist and how that kind of trended downward over time. Uh, that, yeah, that, they... That's always going to happen. With every game, eventually you're going to get to the point where people are going to quit playing. But the problem with the, the trend in the Halo 4 populations is it was just such a drastic drop-off. It was very quick and... And it, it's constant. Like, eventually you get to this point where you kind of plateau. Like, you have this steady player base, but it just keeps going down. Which, to me, signifies that uh, maybe... I, I'm not sure what they can do at this point. Um, I mean, they've been implementing improvements to the game. Um, the game's right. definitely better now than it was when it was first released. Oh, yeah, but at this point, it's almost like it's it's kind of too late. The fact that yeah. they weren't able to pull this off when Halo first dropped is kind of an issue I think Halo has. And unfortunately, I don't think Halo 4 is something they need to really focus on saving. They need to, of course, get the content out there for people that are still really invested in Halo and kind of work that stuff. And now is a perfect time to see what the community wants as a whole from 343 specifically, not necessarily Bungie or Halo as a whole. This is the time for the community to give feedback. And it's obvious that 343 is being very attentive to what people want and they're implementing changes and it's just going to have to be when Halo 5 comes out they're going to have to nail it on the head. Yeah, and I think with Halo 5 they have a better chance of impressing people than they do making changes to Halo 4. Um, I think if they can show off a really, really strong Halo 5 at next year's E3 they can get that player base back, get them excited again. But they're going to have to emphasize the changes that they made in Halo 5. It's They're going to have to really get out there and show people, hey, you know, we realize that Halo 4 wasn't exactly what you wanted it to be. 
we've been making changes. We know what went wrong. And here's Halo 5. We've done a better job. I mean, we're a, we're, I mean, first of all, they've already put out a game, so they have that experience in development. So, I mean, that by itself makes the likelihood of Halo 5 being better than Halo 4 much, much greater. But it's all going to be in how they market Halo 5. And they're really going to have to market it pretty hard to, to get that player base back kind of in that mindset that Halo is the multiplayer FPS experience on the Xbox. Like, if you have an Xbox, there is no reason to not be playing Halo multiplayer. Yeah. It's it's going to take time. Yeah. Uh, 343 is obviously taking time and effort to put everything in Halo 4, but Halo 4's lifespan is only going to be so long here. And there's going to be there's still going to be a decent population that's going to be playing Halo through until Halo 5, but that number is not going to be as strong as Reach's, I think. Well, in our Twitch TV live chat, Pins Halo suggests that the, the weather is getting better and people are spending more time outside, so that could be a factor. Um, yeah, it could be. You get this kind of like conflicting thing going on in the summer where... The kids get out of school, they have more time to play Halo, you know, high school kids. Uh, I, I played Halo 2 in high school, so, you know, I, I loved the summertime because that was prime time to just play Halo all day long. But, uh, you know, you also have this thing where the weather's better, there's... I mean, people need to get outside. Like, if you just sit around in your house all day long, you're going to get depressed. Uh, you know, people enjoy being outside, so... You get this odd thing where people have more time, but do they spend it playing video games or do they spend it going out and doing stuff? Uh, yeah. Well, strange thing for me because I've actually been playing more video games recently because I haven't been as as stressed in putting as much content out. So it's it's kind of taken as, as a reciprocal role for me, but that's that's kind of minor and probably minority. Um, the less you talk about video games, the more time you have to actually play them. That's kind of the... Yeah. The old paradox that the game reviewers had, like, generally, like, m some of the most hardcore gamers on the planet don't play video games very much at all. Like, it, it, at one point, when I was 20, I think, I didn't play video games much at all, except for my DS at the time. Uh, it wasn't 3DS yet, but uh, I was mainly just playing uh, Soul Silver. But other than that, I would nice. read a lot about video games on NeoGAF. And I would stay in touch with video game news and what was going on in the gaming industry, but I really didn't play very many video games. Right. Uh, as far as new stuff goes, uh, let's transition over to the new Xbox. So there, uh, an email promotion went out a couple days ago, and they, uh, Microsoft made the announcement that on May 21st, they're going to reveal the next generation of Xbox content. So the next console their um, game lineup, their entertainment stuff that they're going to be adding. And that is May 21st. There's going to be a stream on Xbox and on Spike. So if you're in the U.S. and Canada, you can tune into Spike TV at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Yeah, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Or you can watch the event from the um, live viewer on the Xbox. And you can watch that uh, free. I think it... Do you have to be a Gold subscriber to use the live event player? I think you do. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it, it shouldn't be that way, in my opinion, but it's that way for almost every single application on the Xbox 360. Yeah, but I think it's most kind people. Of ridiculous. I think most people listen to us have gold already, so it's, it'll be online on your Xbox as well. I mean, you can find it if if you have a television or a PC or some device connected to the internet, you can watch this event. Right. Like, it's, it's not that big of a deal. But, it may I mean, be it, streamed on Xbox.com. I think it is, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure Major Nelson will have a, a stream going up for that. Uh, yeah. So mark so. your calendars, May 21st, the announcement of the next Xbox coming to us very soon. Um, yes. I think we we talked about the rumors behind this a couple weeks ago already, so we don't need to dive too much into that. Um, but I guess we can talk about some of the things that we would want to see. Instead of the rumors of things that we don't want to see. Yeah. Um, For me personally, bigger friends list. Because right now, I am shuffling people in and out of my friends list as I'm playing with new people and going through and seeing people that I haven't played in like over three years. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of frustrating because some of them is like, I want to keep on just for nostalgia's sake. And it's like, there's 
maybe the one once in the blue moon chance that I play with them again. But then it's like, okay, but there's these other friends that I'm meeting and I'm playing with them more often now. So which ones do I go and kick the can for uh, to make way for these new friends? So I, I don't think we need something outrageous, but it definitely needs kind of a, a increase. I want a global clan system across all games. There needs to be a clan just on system. The, on the Xbox Live, just some sort of... like You can call it whatever. It doesn't have to be clans, you know? I mean, generally well, I think, clans I think, have a negative connotation connected to that word. I think if they word. do something with, like, clans or groups, depending on how they implement it for the next ser- next generation of Xbox, is maybe your group can subscribe to this thing and basically pay a, a fee for, per month, and then you can have this group... Um, thing. I have a feeling that's probably the best way to do it. And to me, that's ridiculous. If I'm paying for Xbox Live, which is expensive enough by itself, you know, considering other services are free and competing with Xbox Live, I, I think that they should at least just give me a a way to join a clan for free. Like they shouldn't make me pay for stuff on top of the no, service. No, 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 no. Fee that I don't. Already... I don't think. I don't think you should be charged for joining a clan. I think the clan managers should be paying the fee. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, nobody should have to pay uh, well. to get a clan going, in my opinion. If you're paying for the service, because uh, ultimately, is a clan not really just some sort of friends list, in a way? It's like a friends list that isn't attached to one user. It, it, to me, in, in Halo 2, clans were a system of basically having a second friends list. Right. You got your friends list, and then you have your clan. You play with your clan, and you talk with your friends, and sometimes you talk with your clan. But that clan different. feature was something that was specific to Halo, not Xbox Live as a whole. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. If they can do it in Halo 2, which came out in, what, 2004? Like, there is absolutely no reason you can't implement a system-wide clan system on Xbox Live and not, you know, charge for it. It's, to me, they they need to add more things to Xbox Live. If they're going to make me pay they for do. Xbox they Live... Do. They need to give me more features and more reasons to feel like I'm getting something for my money other than micro. To me, it, at this point, it feels like they're just extorting you. It's like, yeah, you got to pay the cover charge. Eh? It a nice system you got here. It'd be a, it'd be a shame if you couldn't get it online, eh? You know, like you yeah, gotta pay the protection fee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, but I mean, it, I want to feel as if I'm getting something for the amount of money I'm paying. I mean, look at. I keep going back to it when we talk about this, but look at PlayStation Plus. You pay that fee, and you actually get is some sort of perceived value for what you pay. You get games every month that get you know they switch out. You don't get to keep them, but you do. I mean, you get to keep them for the the extent that you have your service active. It's but, like rental. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's better than a rental in a way because if you know that you're going to keep that service, you can play the games as long as you want. It's not like it's a seven day rental. And I mean, I I don't know if the the games are great or not i haven't really kept up with that service and i don't pay for it but uh and maybe that's a testament to why that system is is failing you know i mean that that's clearly a better value than xbox live if you think about it but at the same time i'm not paying for playstation plus and i am paying for xbox live um actually i didn't pay for xbox live this year that came courtesy of mr dustin Uh, i never got around to publicly thanking you for that so Thank you, Dusty. Uh, no need. No it was need. a special uh, co-hosting gift, I suppose. <laughs> you deserve, really it. deserve it. But thank you. Uh, you deserve it. Yeah. Uh, in the chat, somebody said, I think your uh, unusual hiccup said, I think if you pay for Xbox Live, you just get a free Bolt Shot cuddly toy. I want something more different than a Bolt Shot, but yeah, uh, cuddly toy would be cool. Yeah, if they actually send you a plush or something. <laughs> Grunt plushies! Uh... They need to come out with Let's an elite see. plushie. They need to come out I with want, like a whole line of plushies. I want a bobblehead doll of Sarah Palmer, but her head is shaped <laughs> like an egg. Oh my god. That would be hilarious. <laughs> oh my. That would be hilarious. I wouldn't get one, personally, but I could see a lot of value in that. That would be funny, like a cone head Sarah Palmer. Like that yeah. Would, that yeah. would be amazing. Exactly. <laughs> wow. But no, pl- yeah, if plushies... I would, I would, I want to see plushies for the rest of the enemies in there. Get the elites. Get the a hunter plushie would be kind of cute. I think. Yeah. Uh, brute. Nah, you could skip on the brute. Jackal. You could probably do one. Do one with the shield, but then you have the grunt and the elite would be the the plushies to get. 
Yeah, I've seen grunt plushies. Those are pretty cool. Well, um, they had those at Halo Fest. Yeah. Those were an exclusive Halo Fest deal. What kind of plushie would I want? And I got one. The Cortana plushie, maybe? Mmm. Rolling plushie? Oh, no. <laughs> a rolling plushie? <laughs> Uh, I don't, I don't know about Cortana or Roll. The, the whole AI thing, just, I don't know. I think it would kind of be cool, but it would not be for me. I wouldn't get it. Yeah. Uh, just plushies in general, I don't think I would actually buy one. I would take one if it was given to me, but. Well, I, but, I mean, the grunt plushie, it's, it's a grunt plushie. It's really, really cool. I, yeah, I got I mean, one. And, and, and I mean, grunts are kind of cute. Yeah. Grunts are kind of cute. So less, you have to get a grunt plushie. And, I mean, they've, they've become progressively less cute. Over the games. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> I think they tried to re-cutify him in Halo Four, kind of over the the Reach grunt. No, I think they. Reach? No, I think I thought they tried to intentionally make them more intimidating. Uh, to me, it just made him look kind of ridiculous. Like it's neither intimidating nor cute. It's just this kind of middle point. Uh, kind of looks like a dinosaur. Like I, I mean, know, all it... of the aliens in Halo kind of look like dinosaurs, except for the brutes, but. Yeah. Like, to me, that one looks especially like some sort of deformed dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, for me, the grunts seem a little bit more threatening and more serious. They're, it's definitely not as cartoony as it has been in the past. I, I think it's probably the m- most fearsome grunt that we've seen is actually in Halo 4. You know what I'd like to see in a Halo game, even though it'll never happen? Mm-hmm. Are enemies with varying heights of the same species. Like, that you have one cool. grunt that's, like, a little higher than the next one. Like, that, you could actually incorporate that into gameplay. Because right now, if you just point into a group of grunts and they are running at you in the same direction, you can you don't even have to move the reticule. You just move along your, your uh, like, x-axis and not move your reticule at all and just shoot them in the head. Like, all of them. But if you had it to where they kind of have, like, varying heights, you would actually have to move your reticule around uh, to get the headshot. That would be kind of cool. The only... Th- um... The only thing is you would be actually, well, I, no, there are systems that you can actually do to where you can kind of stretch those textures across different size of, of geometry. So, yeah, it's definitely possible. Yeah. It would, it so. would be cool. Um, let's see, some more new features for the Xbox. It's already supposed to have built-in connect. I can't think of, of much else. Do you think it's going to be Blu-ray compatible? I think yes. it's going to have to be. Uh, Paul Therott. Uh, kind of a Microsoft dude. If you're into kind of that tech world analyst thing, uh, yeah. he said that it's gonna have a Blu-ray drive. And generally, he doesn't lie okay. about that kind of stuff. So yeah, I haven't, I haven't watched uh, that uh, show in a while. Oh, uh, the uh, well, is this week in Windows or no? It's it's Windows Weekly, uh, something like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Windows Weekly. Yeah, it's, it's it's one I of the twi- watched Twit and forever. Just in general, it was two years ago. I actually. When I was doing my summer rotations, I would actually watch those during the day. So I would download some of the epi- uh, some of the different shows and actually watch them as- and listen to them as I was going throughout my work day. Well, it was like watching tech TV back before it turned into crap, and then it turned into G4. <laughs> like, <laughs> because, I mean, it was tech TV, people. That's where Leo Laporte kind of started right. his, his video stuff. So Right. So, um, yeah, so it's going to have the Blu-ray. Uh, definitely do not want the style of the controller to change. The no. way the Xbox controllers work, it, it works really well. I, I would like to see them uh, compatible with the new Xbox, but of course there's the rumor going around that it's not going to be backwards compatible with any of the games. So they're likely going to have new controllers and they're going to make you buy the new controllers. So we'll see what happens. Oh, yeah. It, if, they, if they can get you to pay for extra accessories and hardware, they will. I mean, that, that that would be like... Well, I mean, technically you couldn't because it doesn't have the the connector port. But, I mean, th- that would be like Xbox 360 coming out and being able to use the original Xbox controller. Well, I doubt they're going to use something other than USB. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that's, that's pretty much a universal standard now. Yeah. Except for uh, Nintendo. Nintendo still has their freaky-deaky connector as well. I guess they didn't technically have one for the Wii because that was all wireless, but they had the GameCube controllers, which was actually technically USB. It was just they changed the form of the plug. Well, the irony was that the GameCube controller was better for games in general than the Wii U remote or the Wii remote. 
Like people would yeah. actually prefer the the GameCube controller in most games. I well, mean, so some the games thing, you if... the funny thing is, I'm actually throwing kind of a, a, a just a get together this weekend, and I went out and bought four GameCube controllers. Just so we can play like Mario Party, Brawl, Mario Kart, and all that stuff. Yeah, Brawl without some sort of GameCube like controller is is pointless. It's an exercise any, in frustration. Any fast action stuff on the Wii or any Nintendo platform has to have that kind of GameCube controller. You can't do it with the in my opinion, with the, the classic pad or anything else. You yeah. have to have a GameCube controller. Well, even that, I've never used it before, so I don't know, but the Wii U pad itself looks extremely uncomfortable to use. It is very uncomfortable. So. Uh, it's like this thin th- piece of plastic. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it for the hands, it's for the hands of an infant, basically. It, it doesn't fit any hands that, if you're like 12 or over, it's not going to fit your hands well at all. So, uh, it, can I just say something about Nintendo controller. while we're, we're still on that? Yeah. Like, uh, they're not going to be at E3 this year. I mean, they are going to be at E3, but they won't have a presentation at E3 this year. And uh, they've never done that before. That's kind of a new thing. Um, none of the big three have ever actually skipped on an E3 presentation, I don't think. But this year they're going to do their own kind of online event, their own indirect. Um, okay. So it, it, do you think that that's kind of a sign that they're struggling with the the Wii U. I mean, we know they're struggling with it, but do you think that the Wii U is going to end up like the the Dreamcast in the next year? Or? I don't think so, just because of how much of a of a support for the family generation of gamers that has behind Nintendo. Um, I don't think we'll see a fallout of Nintendo. There there may be kind of this lull for the Wii U, and it might not be until they come out with their next console that we'll see Nintendo kind of pop back up, but it. I've had this discussion with several people recently, actually, and I had this discussion again also today, but it seems like Nintendo has these interesting and innovative ideas to really kind of incorporate new things into gaming. So with the Wii, they did motion control, they had the nunchucks, and that was really cool. But they lacked in some of the core areas of consoles where they didn't have HD for the Wii, and they're still using friend codes to hook up with friends, which is a oh, really, really troublesome experience. So it, the, it seems like they're really innovative in kind of pushing gaming because you saw PlayStation and Microsoft follow through with that whole motion gaming with the Move and the Connect. But, but Nintendo just kind of misses some of the core key points of gaming. And it's I don't think it's quite their downfall yet. And I think the market's still in support of Nintendo just with, um, I I don't mean to use stereotypes, but like the soccer moms and the the family-oriented games. I mean, the the Mario games, to me, are fun. I love Brawl. I love Mario Kart. Mario Party is fun for parties. It's it's a good party game and good drinking game. But, so, so there's going to be that presence there. But in terms of of whether or not they're console is going to survive for this round for the Wii U. Um it, I don't think it'll do as well as the Wii, but they they need to kind of pick it up for the, their next console whenever that comes out. Well, what worried me is that uh Nintendo of Japan president uh Iwata said that he might resign because of the performance of Nintendo over the past year. So, I mean, it, anytime you get a CEO saying they're going to resign, like generally, that means that their company's in a bad place, not necessarily a, a place where they're going to go bankrupt. But uh, I mean, look at EA. Uh, John Riccatello left because he saw all of the problems that were arising out of that situation. Like he knew that was coming. I mean, he's had to deal with a lot of EA hate over the past two years, but kind of all came to a head with the the Sim City debacle. Um, so he finally left. I, I don't know. I mean, Iwata even came out and basically said. Hey, we messed up when we called this thing the Wii U. Like, people didn't understand that this is a brand new console. They thought it was a accessory that you buy for your Wii. Like, some people actually thought that it was just the pad that you were buying and that you could use it on your Wii system. Like, they didn't understand. I, to me, it would have even been better if you called it Wii HD. Like, I mean, it, because in that, people know if they have a Wii that it's not in high definition. So at that point, 
they understand that it's a new console, first of all, and second, it's in high def, which to me would be the Wii U's selling point. Like, if I were to go buy a Wii U today, it would be because I don't want a Wii, because that's standard def. Like, I'm, I'm over standard def. I will never play another standard def video game on my television ever again if I don't have to, and it's not emulated on my PC or something. Like, right. any new game needs to be in high definition, at least 720p, and that's, like, minimum. Like, 720p at 30 frames per second, if you don't got that in your game, you're way behind the curb as far as gaming industry goes. Like, so first of all, they needed to, to really sell the fact that Wii U is HD. It is a you know, high-definition console. If you enjoyed the Wii and you would like to see it in much greater clarity and definition on your television, you, you need to switch over to this one. Like, they needed to really bang it into people's head, this is a brand new console. Like, this is the successor to the Wii. This is what the Wii was to the GameCube. Like, this is, you know, but I don't know. I like, Nintendo is probably my favorite video game company. In terms of, like, how I view them as a corporation, how I view their their practices in general, like, they're... they're Nintendo never does anything that's really just egregious, if you ever think about it. Like all, like Sony's right. always doing crazy stuff, like the the whole PlayStation Network getting hacked last year. Like yeah. Microsoft's kind of mellow. I mean, yeah, there's sometimes. I mean, Microsoft's always in trouble though. Like Microsoft's always going to be some sort of evil corporation in somebody's mind. Like, I mean, the fact that anytime you see MS in a chat, it is always M dollar sign. Yeah, is like evidence of that. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're not too bad, but they still have problems with, you know, rumors about the the Durango having always online, and if you don't do that, you can't play your games, and uh, Xbox Live Gold, just the idea of that in general rubs some people wrong, but right. Nintendo really never does anything just egregious like that, and I mean, it, there's also a lot of nostalgia factor there, I mean, if, if you grew up in the 90s, you were probably a Nintendo kid. Like, you were either a Sega kid or a Nintendo kid, and if you were a Sega kid, I mean, I was a Sega kid too, but I mean, I had, I played both consoles. I, I played Sega Genesis, then I moved on to the N64 and the next generation because I, I didn't even know the Sega Saturn existed back then, but, uh, you know, if you were a, a product of the 80s or the 90s, you played a Nintendo console at some point in your life. Probably. So... <laughs> In the chat, somebody said Seeger Kid. <laughs> if, you're <laughs> yeah. like, if you're a Bob Seeger Kid, you would definitely love Nintendo. <laughs> uh, so, um, let's go ahead and move on to the bulletin stuff, because I think we're kind of running out of topics to talk about for the new console. Um, of course, the hardware specs will obviously get probably on the 21st of May. So, that, that'll that be interesting. I, I think there's already some stuff out there. I think, actually, Paul Therott puts out some or anticipated some stuff about the hardware specs for the Xbox. And there was actually a case uh, a little while ago where someone actually leaked the details of the actual hardware, I think. Um, I had to go find it, but it was a pretty decent um, processor for uh, graphics and the CPU. They're uh, bo- Actually, both PS, the PlayStation console and the Xbox consoles are going to uh, Intel... Or x86 based processors, no longer ARM processors or power PCs. So everything that's coded on the, like it's coded for your computer, like your laptop, your desktop, that kind of architecture is now put into the console. So there's not going to be um, this delay of uh, making games. It's actually going to be a little bit more easier to code it because you have the same development tools for Windows as you do for the Xbox. And then for the PlayStation, it's kind of, um, that whole Unix and, and um, the PlayStation operating system kind of thing. So that architecture is similar, which for developers, it'll also be easier to actually code multi-platform games. Yeah, so that's, make more that's money. Be, I mean, yeah. that's a big deal. Right. So another thing for the Xbox is uh, it's rumored to not have as much RAM. Um, yeah. I think someone said they were anticipating 512 megs of RAM which is kind of low. I would think that they would put more in there. Uh, I can't remember if this... Uh, well, okay, that may be graphics RAM. I'd have to go get the actual... or go search the specs, but... One of, one of those counts were low, and 
uh, Gamertag Radio was actually talking about it, and they they were talking about how low of a amount that actually is. But yeah, I I don't think it's going to be that low personally. I, I mean I, it, I don't know, but I mean especially given that the big PS4 selling point is all of that GDDR5. Yeah, you know, I, I I think it's like seven or eight gigs of that in the PS4. Like that was impressive to a lot of people. Especially, I mean, you go to NeoGAF, like, when they announced that, people were going, like, nuts. And, I mean, it, if that was a big selling point for, you know, Sony fans, I don't see why Microsoft would be like, well, I mean, well, we, we saw how excited you got for that, so here's 512 megs of, of RAM for your system. <laughs> right. I mean, obviously, you'd need more than that just for the, the operating system, I'd think. Just run in the background, like, I don't know uh, that much about that think... kind of stuff. I'm just saying, like... To, like no, yeah, I, it doesn't I, I, seem like very much at all. Like, and I'm just a layman, like somebody who doesn't understand that stuff except for the stuff that I learned in like the margins. <laughs> right. Um, I've done a couple of searches real quick for uh, hardware specs. Uh, the next box is supposed to be using an AMD. Uh, I think it's uh, it's yeah, it's eight cores, so it's octa core processor, uh, sixty four bit based. Uh, it's actually uh, two different quad-core processors. Uh, we'll have a uh, AMD HD GPU, uh, 1.2 teraflops per second. That's pretty. That's a lot of graphics power right there. Um, eight gigs of RAM. Okay, so that's actual like uh, <clears throat> memory for the uh, CPU and all that stuff. That's not graphics RAM. Um, uh, 32 megs of RAM on the GPU, huh? Of ES RAM. So they're are they? That's strange. So they share. They're using shared memory for both graphics and operating system and uh core game logic. That's going to be interesting, huh? All right. Uh, USB 3.0, up to 1080p, Connect 2.0, Smart Glass, blah, 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 blah. 500 gigabyte hard drive. That's interesting. So, okay. And, it, uh, another site says it's gonna have the, it's gonna have a 6x Blu-ray drive. So, already. Uh, let's move on to some uh, Halo Bulletin news, since that's what you guys are mostly here for. Uh, th- this week, of course, they're, Continuing their coverage of the weapon tuning, the joint in progress updates that have been that they've been messing around with, about ready to put into matchmaking. Uh, but before that, there was a child's play auction last year, and one of the prizes apparently was um, getting to go to three four three industries, getting a tour of the place, getting to meet some of the developers, and uh, getting to meet some of the cast, and one of which was uh, Jen Taylor, and. Uh, apparently, as part of this thing, uh, one of the prizes was you get a custom voicemail recording from Jin as Cortana. So, there, I think we had Sal on the show at some point recent, uh, recently. I forget which uh, show it was specifically on for, but um, <laughs> he was speculating that Jin Taylor may have been there to record lines for Season 2 of Spartan Ops, but... Uh, according to this, it was for this, uh, child's, this child's play charity, um, auction item that got won, so. Or was it? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh, you're such a kidder. Um, there was, uh, some campaign Easter eggs that was actually hinted on. When was this? When was the last time that we had the, uh, the hints? It was a few months ago. What was it, back in January, uh... February? Appar- I think oh, it was January. February 20- it was February 6th. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, that that brought a lot of disappointment among some of the fans as far as just finding out that they were mainly just, like, weapon drops. Um. Yeah, so it was... They're kind of interesting to have them there, but they're not really useful, like some of the ones that Bungie has done in their previous games. I mean, I'm thinking the Easter eggs as the... Um, like the hearts in the trees from Halo 3, um, some of the mysterious skulls and whatnot. I mean, none of these, like, just 
you, you mysteriously find some weapons. Um, but I guess 343 has a different thought of Easter eggs than Bungie does. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just a weapon. I mean, it, even if it were like a, a special weapon that you could not find anywhere else in the campaign that had some sort of special use, like the Scarab Gun, that is that is a classic Halo 2 Easter egg. Exactly, the reason the that egg gun. is cool, if it were just a plasma rifle up there, like, it, it would have been noteworthy, but people wouldn't remember that. It, it is funny because it is literally the gun from the Scarab. Like, it shoots those blasts off, the, you know, the same kind of kind of plasma lob that the, the Scarab does. Like, that's cool. But these are just right. weapons that you could find anywhere in the campaign, like, just in a certain spot. But, I mean, you think back, and then all the great Easter eggs are the ones that are either funny or, or have something strange attached to them, like... Yeah, you know, nothing uh, as simple as just a weapon. Like, you could look up on Relic and see Chris Carney's face in the moon, and just cool stuff like that. And then, these are just weapons. And I'm not saying... I mean, I'm just saying in, in Halo 5 that the Easter eggs better be significantly more impressive or I'm going to be disappointed once again. Right. Um, and maybe they just didn't have time to, to do really good Easter eggs. I don't know. Maybe Bungie had more time for that stuff because they were just more experienced as a studio and they, they, they kind of have that. I think it's a matter of like having – I mean it's it's an Easter egg. It's not something that you – put much time and effort into well yeah but if you put an easter egg in you still have to test it and you got to make sure that it's something then you know if you put something into a game you will always have to make sure it isn't just going to break everything else in that game and well if it's just a texture I, then that's not going to break anything yeah so and and there's uh, quite a few easter eggs that were textures like the um the monkey men from halo 3 the oh, one yeah. on the the first level those are funny uh monkey man makes a return in uh odst if you uh, at the very last scene, if you push the the camera to the right or the left, I don't remember. Uh, you actually see uh, the monkey man picking something it's out to of to the left. No, it's yeah, it's the, uh, no, it's um Nathan Fillion's character. Um, yeah, what's his face? It's funny that you actually Buck. remember him as Nathan Buck. Fillion. But <laughs> it's Buck. Like so, I yeah, think Nathan Fillion should always be himself in just everything that he appears in. Like he should never <laughs> actually be a character. He's just always Nathan Fillion. Like Nathan Fillion as himself. Uh, yeah, Nathan Fillion is cool. I I would really want to meet him someday. That'd be that'd be really cool. Yeah. Uh, so there's a new list of Easter egg hints that we've been given, and for this time they are on the three missions Forerunner shut down in Infinity. So the first one that we have here is on Forerunner. It's what is it? Hidden weapons lie in wait. Power untold from a crate. Take them all. Control life and death. Make them breathe a dying breath. So this is Forerunner. This is the one that's right before you get to the didact. I'm not sure <laughs> where this one is. It. I guess it's a... There's a crate on there somewhere. There's a couple of crates from what I can remember. But... Uh, take them all control life and death. I'm I'm not exactly sure what that one would be. Any clue any thoughts Brent? Cuz I'm uh, kind of out. Well, I mean, that uh, to me that first kind of riddle or whatever ain't really the riddle. That's just the that's telling you what you're going to get. Like it's hidden weapons. Like they're just telling you straight up if you find this easter egg, oh, okay. it's weapons. Okay. Then the second one actually tells you how to do it. Like control life and death. That's just saying oh, take Oh, okay. Power okay. Weapons. So what is it and where is it? Okay. So I need to re- I need to read the where is it part. Um so where is it? Before the cryptum, hexes lie, standing patiently, do not die. Upon the chime, aim at the square, shoot them both, the fight won't be fair. Yep. So, so uh, before stand the cryptum, on some hexes, shoot something when it chimes, like you'll hear something, like shoot it at a square, I, I don't know which square, but just whenever you hear the chime, shoot at it, and uh, apparently two so this is So this is when you get to the didact. Apparently. Um, hmm, before the cryptum hexes lie. That could be a number of different places around that chamber. I'm wondering if, it, if it's in the... F- when you first get to the chamber, or if it's when you get to, like, the back. But there's... Aren't those there's kind of little um, hexagonal structures that kind of stick up every... Now, every, like, in certain places around that chamber? Kind of like the, in the center of Haven? Yeah. So I'm guessing around one of those, 
stand patiently but don't die. So I guess you you don't kill any enemies to start off with? Or, hmm, that one's interesting. Well, we know it's in the chamber somewhere, so that kind of narrows it down. So if you're on the hunt for the that Easter egg, you can search around there. Um, you want to look at the next one, Brent, or read the stuff for the next one? Uh, sure. Let's see. Uh, mission shutdown provided by Justin Lippert, missions designer. What is it to all who are legends near uh, uh, nil the believer's numbers to smash your enemies asunder? And where is it in the requiem of the beam lies a treasure at first unseen? Okay. In the requiem of the beam. So there's, hmm, it'd be one of the first two towers that you go to. In the Requiem of the Beam lies a treasure at first unseen. Hmm. I'm thinking it may be that one with the gondola. Like at the very end, you know that beam that's up there? Yeah. Maybe like if you crouch walk into it, maybe that's where it is? That'd be my first guess? Well, I think you have to, to crouch a certain number of times. I think that's where the nil the believer's number. Hmm. Who's the believer? Like, I would think it was... Is it a, a covenant? Neil, like, the believer's number to smash like to, your enemies asunder. Hmm. Like, you have to... Cr- to I, I don't know, but to me, it's you have to crouch a certain number of times, but I don't know what the believer's number is. Like, if you can figure that one out, maybe you might be able to get it. Maybe. Um, but I'm going to go to the Halo wiki, look up the believer, see if there's any hits on that. Uh, uh, while you're doing that, uh, Mission Infinity is their third and final clue provided by Dan Callen, mission designer. And what is it? In the heat of battle, the mighty Ac- <clears throat> Arachnid proclaims its love of baked beans to the heavens. Okay. Uh, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> the legendary warrior should venture to the root after contacting his stalwart comrades, but before they reveal themselves, reach out to the root and wait for the call of the cobra hunter. Hmm. Okay. Now that one's confusing for me. Yeah, um, that's a let's, legendary that's actually cryptic. warrior. <laughs> should venture to the root. So... Actually, this one sounds like it might be a cool Easter egg as opposed to just a weapon drop. Like, the mighty arachnid proclaims its love of baked beans to the heavens. Like, that might actually be pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Not assuming this beans. is... Yeah, this is definitely before the second half when you get into the tank. Yeah. Um, you start off in the in the forest. Uh, baked beans. The beans. Was there a can of beans somewhere? <laughs> uh, I think the beans are... The egg, like it, it, the, the egg is just whatever the mighty arachnid is proclaiming its its love it's of love baked, of baked beans. Yeah. So, uh, where's that? The legendary warrior should venture to the root after contacting his stalwart comrades. Oh, so this is probably the part after you meet up with Lasky. Yeah. But before they reveal themselves. Oh, okay. So that tr- that tree that you probably wind up around i'm guessing maybe at the bottom of that the ones right before you get to the um hmm. yeah i'm gonna say it's probably that tree before you con before you get in contact with lasky yeah so punch the root after you contact lasky or 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 like check the tags the iff tags and then go away i don't know how long that delay is or if you have to actually push x to open the door or something i don't think you do i think it's actually something that's automatic but i guess once you get up there you see the dog tags and then you run back down as quickly as possible so okay i think we uh may figure that one out uh did you figure out the believer's number no um i mean i'm guessing maybe seven (laughs) i have no idea i mean i found one thing it says that in halo 4 lasky says spoken like a true believer uh the believer's number. Let's see, uh, wait, not in Halo Four. It was in Forward Unto Dawn. Hmm. Uh, okay. Lasky says to Kyler, "Spoken like a true believer." 
So true. What was Silva's number like? <laughs> I, I actually have no clue if that even has anything to do with. Yeah, this. Tr- I, I think Bungie <laughs> would probably. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Bungie has always had that knack for putting Easter eggs into the game, and having those kind of cryptic messages to go along with it. So, anyways, uh, moving on to weapon tuning. So there's still quite a bit of things going on with the whole uh, weapon sandbox for Halo 4. Uh, as you guys know, 343 in their latest title update released the ability to actually go into the back end behind Halo 4 and tweak some stuff regarding weapon damage, firing rate, accuracy, bloom, everything that you can think of that corresponds to anything with the weapon, they can go in and alter. So yeah. they're still kind of tweaking some stuff. And we have some more updates behind what they're doing with um, some kind of high-profile weapons that everyone's really looking at. So uh, for the first one that they mentioned is the battle rifle. And what they're doing is they're kind of experimenting with an 11-bullet kill. Um, they feel that the exact four shots with the 12 bullets is is a good fit in most cases. But because of latency and online play, it's just not as reliable. And it just gets frustrating with the the kind of the just split second lag. So they're kind of messing around with an 11 bullet kill with the BR, and from what they're seeing, it actually works pretty well. Yeah. Uh, they also kind of uh, are still missing with the firing rate for the battle rifle, but they've currently matched it matched it to the same firing rate as the DMR. So there's these are still not final settings, but these are the ones that uh, they're currently working with, and they're going to be uh, pushing them out when they're ready. That's kind of the big thing here is um, they haven't set a set date when they're actually going to push all these updates out, but when they feel that they have something nailed down that's going to be suitable for um, kind of the global sandbox, then they'll push it out. Yeah. For the DMR, they've reduced the range at which the reticle turns red. Um, that also means that that magnetism thing, um, that only happens when your reticle is red, so that range is also reduced a little bit. Um, one of the reasons is because of how easy it is to actually get people from across the map, so they think the, the long-range accuracy is maybe a little bit too long. So they're kind of reduce that a little bit and kind of increase the skill gap just, just a tiny bit, so the people that still can use the DMR really well are not greatly affected by the reduced range of the reticle turning red. But um, in conjunction with that, they've matched the um, reticle turning red for the light rifle to actually be the same as the DMR. Uh, Also for the light rifle, they've changed the rate of fire uh, for when it's zoomed in. So it actually is shoots a little bit quicker now when you're zoomed in with the light rifle. Yeah. So that that one's always kind of been an interesting weapon for me because I heard I've heard that people really like using the light rifle. I've heard people not liking it too much and that everyone loves the DMR. But as far as um I guess using the light rifle now, seeing that the rate of fire for zoomed in has actually been bumped up, I may actually start using it a little bit more. The issue I have with the light rifle is that it doesn't really have any distinct property like the other precision weapons do like it is literally just a like collaboration of battle rifle at close range and dmr at you know zoomed in uh i mean if you think about it the, the battle rifle has a very specific set of scenarios that it excels in i mean it's it's got a three shot burst uh it's, it's better at closer ranges like mid ranges than it is long range and then the dmr is the opposite like it's got a, a shorter rate of fire but it's better at long range than the battle rifle and I mean, currently, it's probably the most powerful preci- or, uh, precision weapon in the game. But the light rifle is just kind of... It, it doesn't have anything special about it. Like, even the carbine is, is special because of its crazy rate of fire. Like, if you can pull the trigger fast, you can shoot the carbine fast. Um, right. But, I don't know. I don't like the, the light effect on the light rifle either. Like, uh, I get confused between that and, like, other kind of effects on some of the other... Uh, forerunner weapons. I don't know. 
that's not really. I, I just don't feel like it should be there. It's it's like it, well, it's kind of like a banshee just... on Daybreak. It's like why is it there? Like does it improve the game? Does it really make the game better that you put this thing in that you now have to continuously tweak in addition to the other weapons? Like if, if the light rifle was not in Halo Four, would the game suffer for it? I don't think it would. I think nobody would care. Like, but I mean, this is still three for three trying to introduce their own spin on things for Halo. This is them trying to make their remark on Halo. And I don't think the foreigner weapons are necessarily a bad idea. Their implementation might have not been the best, aka the bolt shot. But I don't think it's really been that detrimental to have the incineration cannon, the binary rifle, the light rifle, um, scatter shot. They're all interesting weapons to use and they all have their purposes. Um, I think that the with, with the weapon tuning, they'll eventually get it worked out. But then again, like we said earlier, um, they can only do so much with the Halo 4 sandbox in its current state. And while it seems like they can actually tweak a lot of the settings, the real saving grace of 343 and Halo is going to be what changes do they implement day one for Halo 5. And I think right now that's kind of what they're experimenting with. They're taking the sandbox that they're currently doing, and since they have the ability to tweak all these settings, they're kind of fine-tuning some stuff, and they're going to finally nail down an experience that everyone likes, and then hopefully they'll just kind of copy-paste a good chunk of that into Halo 5 and make that a spectacular game. I guess my problem is that traditionally the Covenant weapons and the human weapons have very distinct properties in battle. They're very different from each other. Uh, it was it was a good contrast, and to me, two two different weapon sets is a good number of weapon sets to have. And then you introduce this third set, and I feel like they really wanted to get innovative with the the Promethean weapons, but they they, they might have played around with some stuff and it didn't work. But the the problem is you add more stuff to the sandbox, and it makes it even harder to maintain a balance between all of the weapons. Like the more stuff you put in, the harder it is to to keep all of that stuff balanced it's like a juggling act the more stuff you put in the harder it is you know but right i i I feel like anything in a video game if it doesn't need to be there if you can look at it and say this game will not be better or worse off if i take it out then it is probably better to simply get rid of it I'm, i'm more of a minimalist guy i feel like you should take elements of your game and you should make them work in conjunction together, but like very cohesively to make a fun, in-depth kind of, uh, I don't know, just it just working well, no, with you... a smaller number of items makes it easier to make those items even more significant in the sandbox. Right. Like if you just had a battle rifle and a DMR and maybe an assault rifle or something like that, and you didn't have all of these other different weapons that you didn't have to waste time balancing in addition to your core set of weapons that gives you even more time to work on that core set. I'm not really sure how to... No, you may, and you bring up a good point, and I think that's one of the reasons why people have kind of gone away from Halo is because some of that core gameplay from multiplayer is really put oh, kind of put on the wayside compared to how 343 implemented Ordnance and what they've done with the new weapon set. And it for most people, it doesn't feel like that classic Halo experience that people know and love from the pre- previous Halo games. And, I I mean, I agree to a point that having just that kind of strict set of weapons before is something that should really kind of be focused on, the whole balance of weapons, grenades, and melee. It's, that's the golden triangle of Halo. If you if you mess with those, and if you mess those up uh, pretty pretty badly, then people are, are going to kind of turn away from that whole experience, the whole sandbox. Um, we've seen weapons get introduced into the game. So the beam rifle, for example, that's, that's, it was a weapon and it worked really well. The fuel rod works really well too. Um, I think with this set of Promethean weapons, you, you kind of nailed it on the head print where it's this new set and, um, they're kind of trying to ham jam it in there where it might not necessarily work the best and being their first game, it might not have been the smartest move to do, but it's not. It's not like the weapons are completely crap. Well, it's they, not that they're awful. I, mean, I, I guess the point I was trying to get across is the more stuff you add in, the more watered down each individual weapon gets. 
because right. then each the, individual the li- weapon has as less importance. Right. I mean, the, their their properties become less important because eventually you get to the point where these guns have similar properties. Like the light rifle has properties that are very similar to the DMR and the battle rifle, both at the same time. And it just it, it makes you wonder, like, if I have both of these properties in one gun, the what is special about the BR? What is special about the DMR? And why am I using the light rifle? Like, instead, you could have... I guess I just would have preferred, like, either choosing the BR or the DMR to be the precision weapon, the primary weapon in the game, and then making that one weapon extremely fun to use. Like, you can build entire experiences around that one primary weapon because you know that people are going to have that weapon every single time. As opposed to having all these different functions where you have to make sure that all of them work equally well in any given scenario, which makes the individual functions of each weapon just less important overall, like I was saying earlier. But well, I think that kind of pulls at the point where each quote-unquote class of weapon only needs one weapon. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, that kind of goes against the kind of design philosophy that they had for multiplayer in Halo 4. I think originally they wanted to go even more in-depth as to how you could customize the way your Spartan you know, spawns into battle. Um, I'm not really sure how, but the kind of the idea was, Hey, call of duty gives you all of these weapons that are, some of them are very similar to each other, but people like that because they like, you know, leveling up and then unlocking things. Um, and to me, I'm not a big fan of the philosophy that says we're going to keep people playing the game by giving them these kind of gradual unlocks that you get for playing over time. Like I'd, that's not the kind of game I enjoy. To me, that's right. just basically, you know, game designers taking a class in psychology and learning that people, I mean, it's like, it's like the Skinner box, you know, if, if a hamster keeps hitting at the button and he gets a, a pellet every time, you know, he'll hit the button every time, but then he'll eventually quit. But then if he hits the button and sometimes it doesn't come out, like he'll keep hitting the button until it comes out. Like it's people just taking a, a psychology class. Like, and to me, I don't like feeling as if the game developer is trying to keep me playing their game through these artificially crafted loot method. Like, it, it it works in some cases. Like, Borderlands takes that concept to its extreme, and that works extremely well because they understand that the idea of getting all of this loot all of the time is ridiculous, and they work around that. Like, Borderlands is a ridiculous game. It is a ridiculous setting. The The weapons you get are ridiculous. The, the, the number of customization options are ridiculous for an FPS, at least. Uh, single player. Not really single, but you get what I'm saying. Not competitive. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. That's what they know. I mean, that's, it's funny. That's, that's the point. You know, I yeah. mean, in the original Borderlands, they, I think they, uh, said that there were like six bazillion guns or something, like some fake number, but. Yeah, and then they, they went out of proportion for this one. Yeah. I don't know. I, anyway, they're, they're tuning these things. So I'm all I'm saying is I hope in Halo 5 they get the idea that adding more weapons is not necessarily better and can lead to a watered-down experience, and they need to focus on their primary weapons. They just need to go down the list, figure out which weapons they like, which weapons don't necessarily have to be there. Just take them out. If it doesn't have to be there, if it doesn't make the game better or worse, then it simply doesn't need to be there and just take it out. But Right. There, uh, there's a bunch of different it. things that they're they're looking at, but yeah. We'll move on. Uh, assault rifle. Yeah. Uh, currently so, kills in 16 rounds, and they're changing it to kill in two or three less shots. Uh, they said it's technically possible to kill two people with one magazine right now if you don't miss a single shot. But that's kind of tough with an automatic weapon like the assault rifle. Yeah. You have to know like which bullet to pull off on. Yeah. Um. As far as the whole auto aim for the assault rifle, they're still kind of messing with it, but there's a, a decent amount of reduction in the auto aim for the assault rifle. So it's going to take a little bit more skill to actually use that. But usually if you're up close, you're not having to worry about it too much. It's probably kind of more of those mid-range situations where it's on the edge of the reticle turning red where that's going to be a big issue for people. Um, they also said that the kill time is somewhere in between Halo CEs and Halo 3s. Halo 3s was really long, in my opinion. 
and Halo CE was. I, I, I don't know. Does that mean they really slowed it down? Because the Halo th- Three assault rifle, or the Halo Three assault rifle and the Halo CE assault rifle, seemed pretty long. Although for Halo CE, it was actually pretty short at close range. So maybe that's what they're basing that timing off of. So if it's a short range one, then yeah, I, I could see the firing range falling in between there. But if it's like at medium range, then I still think the AR is probably not going to be as long as either one of those. Like, was um, auto-aim ever really a big deal for the AR and I Halo 4? I don't think 4? so. Like, I, I don't know because I don't use it very often. But, I mean, traditionally, I. if you're using the AR, it's at fairly close range. And, I mean, the, the reticule on the AR is pretty big to begin with. So, yeah. I I mean, it's not I a mean, the few times. Either. No, but the few times that I've used it and I've seen people use it, it's actually very effective at close range. Yeah, but I'm saying auto aim. Like, it, it, does reducing the auto aim on the AR like make it that much harder? Like, I don't really? think it does because I mean, I, most I of the time un- you're using that up close. I can understand auto aim on headshots, maybe, but the the assault rifle you don't have to get headshots. You just plow rounds into somebody's midsection, you know, center mass, and that that's not really that hard. I I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't use it that often, but right. It, it's it says that it makes it quite difficult as compared to prior to the auto aim changes. So yeah, I I don't exactly know what that means either because the few times I've used it, it doesn't really seem to have that much of an effect. Um, we'll we'll see what that what that does too because I actually have heard a lot of people say that the AR in Halo Four has been one of the most balanced ARs in all the Halo games, and now they're messing with that how is that going to affect that balance well i enjoy using ar i mean i don't do it very often because i mean just the way i've always played halo is you use the battle rifle or in reach you use the dmr or in this one you use whichever but i mean it, I've, I've used the ar in halo 4 and some of the other uh automatic weapons and it's it's a lot more fun than it traditionally has been i mean right you, you get a lot more kills it seems like generally it seemed in like the prior Halo games, you might get one kill with the AR and then you die. So your kill-death ratio was always going to be one. <laughs> but in this, <laughs> you, you can actually go around and get multiple kills with each respawn. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, all these settings are still being tweaked. There's nothing final yet. But they're working on building a final release schedule. And when they have uh, all the details ironed out, they will uh, let us know what the final settings are. And they will let us know when it gets put out. And of course, we can wait for next week's update um, when they uh, give us more information on what they're currently doing. So next on the list is the Join in Progress update. So they're still looking, are paying close attention to player feedback for the whole Join in Progress stuff. Uh, they've come out with some uh, new stuff that they're looking at in terms of making changes to the Join in Progress system. So... They're kind of basing it off of the score that's currently in the game, the time that's left, and all that stuff. But there's some bullet points that they provided. Um, first, for their uh, join in progress parameters, once a match has passed over just half of the total game time, join in progress is disabled across all game modes and playlists. Rumble Pit now has the smallest join in progress window, only allowing players to join during the first few kills of a match. Uh, in Slayer matches, outside of Team Throwdown and Team Doubles, players will no longer join after one team has reached just over half of the score limit. You want to take the last three, Brent? Yes. In King of the Hill and Oddball, players will no longer join in the second half of the game in regards to score limit. In Griffball, players will no longer join single round matches if over three goals have been scored by one team. We'll be updating Griffball Pro to similar settings in the next update. In Team Throwdown and Team Doubles, players will no longer join after a small join window during and before the first moments of a match. You can tell my chihuahua is excited about this uh, this join-in-progress update information. (laughs) It's like, you're doing it right, you're doing it right. (laughs) It's like, no! No, uh, change it! (laughs) Change it again! So, again, they're still kind of tweaking the whole join-in-progress settings. Um, If you have any feedback about any of the stuff or any of the current implementations of the Joint in Progress system, of course, you can head over to the Waypoint forums and leave your feedback over there. Uh, I personally have not had any issues with the Joint in Progress system after the uh, the first title update. I have never had an issue. Sometimes it's annoying when you get that, like, 
kind of rare join in progress where the other team was just way ahead. I mean, that was that was annoying, but it didn't happen frequently enough to really bug me. Uh, generally, when you go into matchmaking, you will find a new match. Um, I really don't know what the ratio of join in progress to new matches is, but I would guess that it's fairly low. Uh, it, it's <laughs> I mean, think about it. You also benefit from from join in progress in games where you have lost teammates generally sometimes. I mean, right. So it's, it's kind of this double edged sword type of thing where a lot of people don't like joining in progress because of how the games might be currently situated when you join in. But at the same time, it's those people that are in those situations where they've lost players. It's like, well, it would really be nice to have someone come in and help fill this spot that got left open. So it's, People have different opinions about it, but I think the one big cry from the community is just to have the option to actually not join in progress. I don't know if that's something that they can add in to the system anymore just because of how it's been done. Um, that seems like one of those changes where it would be very hard to make. I'm not sure how the code base is designed for something like that. So I think that's something that we're pretty much stuck with for now until Halo 5 where they fix that, but I think the whole join in progress system is not a bad idea. No. I mean, I don't, it's, it's one of those things that, if it isn't there, fine. If it is there, and, you know, uh, they're obviously making improvements to it, that's fine too. Right. It, it doesn't bug me either way. But um, Rasputin it's, it's good to see... Uh, go ahead. Rasputin in the chat said they need to uh, have the option in there to not join in progress or to kind of fix those things because of CSR. Yeah. They said in, I think it was last week's bulletin, or the the weekend before that, but they actually said that how CSR would be affected by joint and progress stuff. And yeah, it does kind of take a negative impact if you do end up joining a game where you you are in maybe that rare window where you're going to be losing pretty badly when you join in and then you just kind of get obliterated at the end. Yeah. But well, I think the way you would fix I don't that think that's... is... Go ahead. Uh... You just make it to where any time you join in progress, uh, you can't go down in CSR. Like, you can only go up. That way, if you join in progress and you lose, you know, too bad. I mean, the, the problem with that, though, is, well, I mean, it's not really a problem. Because if you win and you joined in progress, I mean, you probably deserve to increase your CSR. But, I mean, right. that way, it, nobody, it, it, the complaint is that if you go into a join in progress match and you lose... You might not have deserved to go down in CSR because you joined a match that might have put you in a distinct disadvantage. Uh, right. So you fix that by just not making join in progress matches negatively affect the player that joined. Yeah. So that wraps up the bulletin for this week. Uh, minus the screenshots, which this week they are uh, themed assassin. So some pretty cool ones in here. Uh, mostly the visual effects on most of these are the ones that actually make these screenshots look cool, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, quite a few of the ones I like. Uh, let's see. Execution by Reclaimed Halo. He actually has a few good ones uh, that 343 uses quite a bit. Um, let's see. Regicide by Advanced Jones. Fade by A Bad Password. Um... Those are kind of my three favorites. What about you, Brent? Um, I like Capture the Flag by DeLuca34. I mean, it's real simple. I don't like the the guy in the Photos armor. Like, that effect really doesn't... Uh, it's not that cool, but I like the effect around that uh, blue Spartan. Also, that armor is pretty slick. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's pretty cool armor. Uh, isn't that the Venator armor? I don't know the armors, yeah, I, dude. I have personally not cared too much. Uh, Through Shadows is a pretty good one, too. Yeah. Uh, Execution's pretty cool, I guess. Just that kind of backdrop that they got. Kind of nighttime. Yeah. That was, the, that was the one I first mentioned off. I like that yeah. one. That was by Reclaimed Halo. He makes some really, really good Halo 4 screenshots. And they actually use quite a few of them in their presentation at PAX. So he, he makes good screenshots. Okay, that's up for the bulletin. Uh, we got the submissions, and we actually only have one this week. So, uh, Brent, I'm going to give you the honors of reading that submission, if you so please. All right. <clears throat> uh, RJDS says, 
Hey, Potacular, I was just thinking about the SMG when a magical idea slapped me across the face. After recovering, I came here to tell the world by pressing the very big submit button on the front page of your website. Very attractive font, by the way. So after entering my epic name and email, I started typing this long story and now for my awesome idea. <laughs> since, person, since personal loadouts are very likely to be returning to Halo 5, do you think the SMG would be an excellent secondary weapon? Maybe the damage could be lowered, but it would be awesome having that gun return as a loadout weapon. Maybe this idea wasn't as cool as the next guy's, but I still, but it's still good, I guess. I'm going to end it here. I have to go eat my magical brownies that I made on Monday Night Matchmaking. Peace. Oh, boy. Yeah, that was that was interesting. The magical brownies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as far as having the SMG in there, that kind of goes, that kind of harkens back to the conversation we just had about having the DMR and the BR in there. Um, I guess that leads to the conversation of which would be preferred. Would you ha- like to have the AR or the SMG be that automatic weapon of choice? To me, the cool thing about that. Go ahead. I personally would like the AR to be the automatic weapon. I think they actually tuned it very well for Halo 4, and I think they kind of found that balance finally that the AR plays well within the sandbox. Um, as far as the SMG, it has potential, but I think it would have to be very, very close-range assault rifle compared to or a close-range automatic weapon compared to the assault rifle, which is a more close-medium-range weapon. Uh, to me, the, the cool thing about the SMG in Halo 2 was the fact you could dual-wield it. Like, that was what they did. They, they yeah. took the AR and they said, we're getting rid of this for this game, and we're replacing it with the SMG because we're introducing dual wielding and we want a dual wieldable automatic weapon. And you can't, I mean, obviously the Chief could dual wield ARs, but that would look a little more ridiculous than holding the SMG. That'd be so cool. Yeah. Dual wielding ARs. Yeah, so it, it, it could be interesting. To have the SMG in there, I th- I personally think the AR is probably the way that they're going to go with in terms of an automatic weapon. Yeah. But who knows? Sky's the limit. They may come out with the BRDR combo combination again for Halo 5 and maybe throw the SMG in there too. We will see. Uh, so that's the only submission that we got, unfortunately. Uh, but a couple of things that we want to uh, bring to your guys' attention... Hey, RTD is actually in the chat room too. Um, but Griffball Hub, our good our good friends over there, actually was uh, doing a Kickstarter for RTX where they were going to be uh, raising funds for a booth, and they passed their final stretch goal within hours of their uh, Kickstarter ending, which is actually it ends here as of this recording in about an hour. So. Um, Congrats to those guys for making their uh, final stretch goal. There's going to be Griffball playable at the uh, Griffball booth at RTX. And they're going to be giving away lanyards, t-shirts, and a whole bunch of other cool swag that you can go pick up. So it's um, the community really pulled through on getting this Kickstarter to be a reality. And for those that are kind of really heavily focused on Rooster Teeth and everything, you know that they're... They invented Griff Ball. They're big into Griff Ball. They really love Griff Ball. So it's really cool to see something like this going through a Kickstarter actually pull through together. So just shows you how cool the awesome, cool and awesome the Halo community is. So major shout outs to those guys. Those guys, congratulations on hitting your stretch goal. And I know I'll be at RTX. Brent will be at RTX. So um, if any of you guys are, are going to be there, we will see you there. Uh. There was the premiere of Playtime Season 4 that was up on Waypoint this last week. And we had Cruel Legacy on our show last week to talk about it a little bit. So if you have not seen the first episode, definitely head over to Halo Waypoint or uh, PlaytimeShow.com where you can watch the first episode of Playtime Season 4. So make sure you go check those out. On a final note... um. I forgot to do a question of the week last week, and I'm really, really sorry. I uh, didn't mean to forget, and I know I had a good one, but i um, going to scrap that for something a little bit different this week, and I'm actually going to ask one this week. So, question of the week. Um, what would be um, your preferred additional weapon in Halo 5? If you could add one new weapon in Halo 5, 
what would it be and what effects would it have? So that's going to be the question of the week. Since we were kind of talking about weapon tuning and everything, I thought this would be an interesting question to kind of put out there. So if you could add one weapon to the Halo sandbox for Halo 5, what kind of weapon would it be? What would it do? What would the damage be like? What would the projectiles be like? Go into details. So that's the question for the week. What would you do for a Klondike bar? <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> what would you do for a Klondike bar? Yes. Uh, I want the grab gun from Half Life. Ooh. <laughs> I don't know. Or the portal gun. That'd be w- cool. W- would it be actually be able to pick up Spartans because they're pretty heavy? Or would you just be able to pick up terrain and vehicles and all that stuff? Uh, like you could pick up a mongoose, and, like chunk it across <laughs> the map. That would be hilarious. It'd be like a mini. It'd be like a mini. Uh, a portable grav lift or man cannon. Yeah, like I'd get somebody to drive the mongoose at me. I'd use the the grab gun, you'd pick him up, and you know chunk him towards the flag. Very effective. Or take him and like chunk the the mongoose at just people in general. Try to get splatters. Yeah. Um, thinking what else you could throw. It'd be cool if you could take the the grav gun, pick up a sticky, and then stick someone with it. Oh, so like, a, <laughs> it's like you know, unstick it's a, it from something, or? Well, no, just like a plasma grenade. That's like you, you know, when they're not active, they just roll around. You have to actually activate it. But you like pick it up with the the grab gun, and then it activates, and you can shoot it at somebody. Kind of like the the plasma. Oh, okay. Rifle, but cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. RJ um, Diaz says flamethrower. Uh, we had that. Yeah, it's obviously. already been in the game. So, that I mean, it wasn't actually as fun as I wanted it to be. It just didn't have the range on it. No, and it in Halo Three it made you really really slow. Halo One it was all right, and it was only on Halo PC of course. Yeah. Um, but Halo Three since it was like basically a turret, you walked really slow. The range wasn't that far, so it was kind of something that got overlooked. And it was effective for certain situations. I remember playing on Construct where you would go up and get the flamethrower and you just camp between the two. Um, Lifts. Lifts, yeah. Yep. So that was always fun. You, th- oh, that yeah, was probably getting... the most effective use of that weapon was on Construct. That's actually the only use I can actually remember for that weapon. Like, I'm sure there's other ones, but every time I think of the flamethrower, I think of just you standing of in Construct. front of one of those lifts on Construct. Yep. And just <laughs> And it's fun, too. I mean, but it's just not very useful. It's, it's not yeah. versatile at all. Yeah. So that wraps up this show on this sprint. I think, unless you have anything else, I think we're done. Nope. Uh, I think that's it. All right. So thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, everyone, on the live stream for uh, tuning into our show, which is live on Thursdays. You can go to our website, podtacular.com, and while you're there, you can send us a submission using the big green button on our homepage, or you can send us an email directly to submissions at podtacular.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 240-200-HALO. That's 240-200-4256. And any method you plan on doing those, just leave us something that's Halo-related. It could be a funny story or a funny situation that you had in matchmaking. Anything that's Halo-related, just feel free to send it our way, and we'll cover it on the show. Um, if you have any questions about anything from the bulletin, we'll definitely answer those to the best of our abilities. Make sure you follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, all of our social media sites. And you won't miss a beat on anything that we have in terms of uh, podcasts that are coming out and other events that we have. Uh, Speaking of events, we have a few events that are going on currently right now. We have Wacky Wednesdays. That happens every Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, We have Monday Night Matchmaking, which is going to happen every time there is a playlist update in the bulletin. So that's basically every other week. So we had one this week, so we will not have one next week, but we will the week after. And that's just to kind of help free up time for myself so I can actually work on some other projects that I have, Halo-related. One of which being the Spartan Ops book that I've been working on. And one of them being the forums, the new forums that are way overdue. And of course, one project that I've been working on pretty closely with over the last uh, few months is the Halo Mole. So um, one of my good friends, uh, Jack Fire Dragon, who's been on the show before, has been putting together this event slash reality reality gaming show where you have the potential to win up to 25,000 Microsoft points. 
And I highly encourage you guys to go check it out. We will have him on the show to talk about it and kind of go through what the Halo Mole is actually about. But you can go to thehalomole.com and check out our teaser over there and sign up for your chance to play a part in the uh, the mole, the Halo Mole, and for a chance to win 25,000 Microsoft points, which is quite a bit. So definitely go over there, check that out. Um, finally, anything that you can do to help us out is appreciated. And for that, we have a donation button on the homepage. So if you go to podtagular.com and scroll down a little ways, you'll see on the right-hand side there's a little donate button. Um, we provide the show free, of course, but any contributions to our are going our way definitely helps. Uh, we had one recently that made it, uh, made it made us able to actually get Twitch Turbo. So we have ad-free broadcasting for our podcast, for our game night streams, and all that good stuff. So uh, if you feel generous or you want to give back to uh, the podcast and what Brent and I do to bring this every week and for the game nights that we do, definitely feel free to send any amount of money that you want our way. We definitely appreciate all the help that you would give us. Uh, with that said, thank you guys again for listening. We will see you guys back here next week for the next bulletin. And until then, oh, wait, I'm not going to say keep on firing truck shit because Brent, you had something that you wanted to bring up earlier. The, uh, Oh, yeah, Palmer comic. Yes. Uh, yeah, so Dark Horse Comics is coming out with a new comic series uh, about Sarah Palmer's time as an ODST uh, before becoming a Spartan 4. So if you're interested in Sarah Palmer and her backstory, uh, you might want to check that out. I'm not sure when it's uh, being released. I uh, have to... Right. I'm not sure if they even mentioned if it's going to... Or a, a release date at all, but it's coming. Um, so... But that's awesome because we've definitely had conversations on here where we really wanted to see the backstory behind Spartan Palmer. Oh, yeah. So it'll be finally nice to be able to see what kind of, or how she got to the position where she is today, how she become commander of the Spartans on Infinity. Um, just the backstory is going to be oh so good, I think. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this because I've wanted to know kind of what makes Palmer tick for a while since we saw her in Spartan Off Season 1. I want to know why she hates Egghead so much. Like, if, if there's too. not some sort of Egghead encounter, like, if she's not complaining about scientists in that comic, I will be extremely disappointed. Well, there has to be the the ability in there to actually deal with scientists. So, it's, I mean, maybe it was her first opinion of scientists, and maybe that's why she said Egghead's a lot in the first half, and maybe in the second half she realized that there weren't necessarily so... Dumbfounded. The scientist killed her parents. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> That's why she hates them. Ouch. All right. Well, that wraps it up for us tonight. Uh, thank you guys again for listening out, everyone, on the live stream. Thank you for tuning in live, and we will see you guys next time. Uh, see ya. Uh, keep on fragging updates. I, I really don't know what to frag this week.